as part of Pantsuit Nation, for those of you who have heard that group. Uh, we broke off from that group when they decided to become non-political. We wanted to become political, so we became a political advocacy organization. And we have local, or statewide organization, we have local chapters across Illinois. We at ABT have two primary goals, advocacy and education. So we want to get more people involved in political advocacy, but we also want to help them become better advocates. We want both quantity and quality. So for example, we have a series of advocacy trainings. I know some of you picked up the, the list over there that we give across the state. And we host forums like this so that people can get firsthand information about the issues that are important to them and they can go out and use that information for good. Um, we also have a research-based approach to our advocacy where we aim to make sure that when we ask our members to do something, it's the right action. It's an effective action and not some well-intentioned but less useful thing that you know exploded on the internet, especially in the wake of the November election. We know people have limited time and energy and we want to make sure that we use your time and energy for things that are going to be really impactful. ABT also aims to advance progressive values at every level of government, from the schoolhouse to the state house to the White House. So what that means we're, is we're involved in local issues like affordable housing uh, and police oversight. We're involved in state issues like school funding or protecting women's choice. And we're involved in federal issues like health care and there are too many federal issues to list. <laughs> I wouldn't know where to begin. Uh, one of my own personal missions is to get pe more people involved in state politics because, as I've been saying, like a broken record to anybody who will listen, uh, state politics is as, if not more important than federal politics, especially right now with who we have sitting in the federal government. And that's one of the reasons that we've been holding these gubernatorial candidate forums. So that's just a little bit about us, and I'd be remiss if I didn't add my the impassioned plea of any nonprofit organization. Uh, if you enjoy this program and want to support our work, we have a jar in the back. Please add a little something to the jar. You can take a button. One of our one of our big pushes now is to get people to vote in the 2018 election. So we made vote, you know, go out and vote buttons out there. If you make a donation, please feel free to take a button. Even if you don't make a donation, you can take a button as long as you promise that you will wear it. Uh, these events cost money, and for the cost of a cup of coffee a month, you can help us continue this work and really fuel our contribution to the resistance. Okay, so now to welcome our guest of honor. Uh, Daniel Biss has taken an unusual path into politics. <laughs> In an era of reality show politicians, he's a bit of an egghead. Sorry. <laughs> but you are. That's the best uh, you graduate, he graduated from Harvard, summa cum laude. Told you, he's an egghead. And went on to get his PhD in mathematics at MIT. He then moved here to become a math professor at the University of Chicago. While his background may seem a little weird for Illinois politics, <laughs> if you think about it, many of our problems actually boil down to math. Numbers that just don't ever seem to add up. Revenue, spending, it just doesn't balance out. Uh, so his experience in this area may be more useful than it might seem at first glance. Daniel became drawn into politics by the aftermath of 9-11 and especially the disastrous path to the second Iraq war, which he saw as highlighting the need for more honesty, transparency, and accountability in government. He ran for office and became a state representative in 2012 and a state senator for this district in 20, uh, sorry, in 2010 and a state senator for this district in 2012. Okay, sorry. Daniel has a unique perspective on what I've taken to calling the really big mess in Springfield <laughs> because he's the only candidate in this primary who has state legislative experience. That means he's the only one who's seen our state government's dysfunction <coughs> firsthand and the only one who was involved in the Herculean effort to get a budget passed over the governor's veto just a couple of weeks ago. Thank you. 
to you and your colleagues for your work on that. We know it wasn't easy, and we're enjoying being a little more of a normal state and not like this punching bag of the entire country. Uh, in Springfield, Daniel has a long record of fighting for progressive policies and actually getting bills through the legislature, even in this extremely difficult political environment. The list of legislation he's championed is way too long to get into here, but it includes bills supporting women's reproductive rights, equal pay for equal work, a statewide minimum wage, uh, increased workers' protections, LGBTQ rights, automatic voter registration, immigrant rights, and much, much more. I think, do we have a list of legislative filings? We may or may not. Um, Such a thing exists. If, it, if it's not if here, it's not, if it's there's, not here, there's no electronic the form version okay. of it. We'll, we'll find it for you. Distributed. You do have a zero rating from the NRA. I'm sorry. I know that you just <laughs> that tonight. <laughs> Daniel's passion for these issues and his tenacity in fighting for them are something I've seen firsthand and personally, most recently in the minimum wage battle here in Evanston and in Skokie. When it looked like our towns were suddenly in danger of blocking the wage increase, Daniel dropped what he was doing, took time out of an absurdly busy schedule, and sprang into action, making phone calls and mobilizing residents to make sure that our towns did the right thing and that workers in our community could come a little closer to making a decent living wage. When he's not working for us in Springfield, Daniel lives in Evanston with his family and can often be seen at Kurt's Cafe, at least he used to be when you weren't so busy, probably not so much anymore. We're so honored to welcome Evanston's very own gubernatorial candidate. Thank you, Elisa. I'm deeply concerned about my inability to live up to what was just said. So I'm, <laughs> thank you, I think, is the right way to handle this. I also am overwhelmed by the turnout, though I'll say it's a, definitely a moment of reminding me of what life was like in the classroom. We have a room that's over full and empty seats in the front, so uh, <laughs> y'all should uh, do what you will with that information. But I, personally speaking, feel lonely right up here in the very front. Um, I am just, you know, listen, I, I love running for governor. It's, um, it's a joy, it's an education, it's an honor. It feels like we're doing this in the middle of an utterly critical moment for the state of Illinois, and I feel remarkably energized by it. But I'll say that it means I spend a lot of time away from home. I spend a lot of time in front of audiences where I don't recognize a single face. I spend a lot of time trying to kind of tell what the story of what brought me into politics to a lot of people who certainly have never heard of me before and quite possibly don't care anyhow. And it's just nice to be home. It's nice to be with a room full of uh, uh, people, some new faces, in fact, with a lot of old friends as well. Um, so that leaves me in a bit of a um, conundrum to even know what quite to say. Um, so I'm just going to say a few quick things about the process that led me to get into this race, uh, which I know was a decision that surprised some people, like me. <laughs> and, uh, and then I'll just let y'all guide the discussion, and we've got a fair bit of time, and so we can take it any direction we like. But I look at this organization, Action for a Better Tomorrow, and I think about those moments that we all lived together shortly after the presidential election, those moments of kind of dread, panic in the pit of our stomachs that we felt uh, in the middle of the evening of November 8th that kind of led into a despair late in the evening of November 8th and then it turned into a morning of November 9th feeling of resolve. And I think that those were crucial, crucial moments for our country. Not just because we figured out that something terrible was happening, but because we figured out that there had been something very dangerous brewing for some time and that nobody was going to take care of it for us. That we had a responsibility to come together and grab hold of control of our own communities and solve it ourselves. And so I think back to a meeting that this group put on in, um, please sit in the front. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you do what you want to do. I don't mean to, to call you out, but it's just, Anyway, I, it's a, my own neuroses, they're complicated, I'm sorry, it's not your problem. Um, 
I think about the meeting that was held in the women's club of Evanston that many, maybe a lot of you were at uh, the Saturday or Sunday right after Thanksgiving. In a time when, you know, Barack Obama was still the president and the Trump administration in waiting was still kind of trying to figure out how to name their own high level appointments and we just didn't really have a sense of what was happening but we were scared to death. And it was just in the middle of the Thanksgiving weekend, a room full of people hanging from the rafters, just there to figure out what we could do together to make it better, to make it better. When Jan and I and Robin Gable had that meeting at the Unitarian Church a week and a half after the election, we were overwhelmed by the turnout. We shouldn't have been, but we were overwhelmed because our initial assumption is that people are going to be too depressed to get out of bed and show up at the Unitarian Church. And instead, everybody in Evanston wanted to stand up together and figure out what we could do together. And what I have learned now in the course of traveling the state of Illinois all day, every day, is that this exists everywhere. This exists everywhere. It's not just the case that, you know, Evanston and like maybe Oak Park and Hyde Park and then like a few neighborhoods on the farmer side of Chicago are where there is all kinds of new progressive activism. It's in every single corner of Illinois. Uh, the most recent example that I found striking was I went to South Beloit a week ago, right now, actually. A week ago, right now, I was there. This is a town that's not, I mean, it's a lovely place, but it's not really noted as being a hotbed of progressive activism. <laughs> but there was a room, no offense, but a room about this size, about as full as this room, of people from that community just hungry, just hungry to figure out what we can do together to fix all of this. And to me, that is the most important thing that we're experiencing right now, and not the attacks from uh, the Trump administration, not the catastrophic round or administration, not even the extraordinary, vicious, unnecessary, grotesque pain that the state is being put through by virtue of having no budget for two years and six days, but rather the realization that if we're going to fix any of this, we're going to have to come together and transform our political system and understand that is at least as necessary on the state level as it is anywhere else because here's how state government has worked forever. People didn't really pay a lot of attention. Springfield was far. It's not that clearly covered in the media. We have grown over the course of not years but many generations to have extraordinarily low expectations for what comes out of Springfield. Those expectations have been met every single day of the week. <laughs> and so why bother? Why bother? <clears throat> well, of course, somebody bothers. There are political machine entities that are self-interested, and they bother. There are extraordinarily wealthy people who have tremendous interest in what the tax code looks like, and they've certainly bothered. There are people who benefit from our current grotesque mechanism of funding our school system. They've bothered. There are people who like having a political system that's run by big money, and they've bothered. And to the point that Elisa was making about um, the battles that we had here in Evanston and in Skokie with, uh, on the minimum wage, there are people who pay wages, wages that keep people out of the middle class. And they certainly enjoy the freedom to not pay a living wage, and they've bothered. And so what we've had is a state government that's been run by a few, and it's entirely ignored the rest of us. And the changes that need to be made to fix this on a public policy level are not complicated and are not new. And it's very nice when people talk about me being a mathematician, and I appreciate that, and I think that really does help. But you don't need to be a mathematician to know the right answers for Springfield. You just need to be willing to say things that upset people who have been financing campaigns, to say things that upset people who have been benefiting from the system that we have, and to say things who upset, that upset people who have figured out how in an environment where most of us don't pay attention to control the political system. And so the question that I kept asking myself as I was trying to figure out do I get into this race or not, wasn't just the question of what do you do when you're running against Bruce Rauner or how do you figure out a way to get more votes than him in November of 2018. Though we better get more votes than Bruce Rauner in November of 2018, no matter who the Democratic nominee is, let's be clear about that. But that's not the only question I found myself asking. The other question is can you build a political movement to withstand all of this stuff that has stopped us from doing that which we've needed to do for decades? And that which has left us kind of numb to our extraordinarily low expectations for our government 
in, the, in Springfield, which has consistently realized those low expectations. I think this is the moment to build that movement. I think this is a moment to tap into not just the anger and hurt and sadness about Trump, and not just the pain that people have felt across the state of Illinois for the last two and a half years, but into a moment that we can finally have an aspirational vision for what government can do to lift people up. And if we are able to stitch together a coalition across the state of Illinois that has that set of demands, use that coalition to elect a governor who's prepared to make a bold, aspirational vision for what we can do in the state of Illinois, that will create a power base that will transform what happens in Springfield. That observation is what brought me into this race for governor. And so I would like to just take your guidance on where this conversation should go. I'm happy to talk about public policy in Springfield, either right now what's going on with the budget or where we ought to be going long term. Happy to talk about the politics of this campaign in particular. Happy to talk about Trump and the resistance. Happy to talk about all those things. But I'd like to sort of take your guidance as we figure out which, which direction to go. Thank you. So uh, you said we're here among friends, so maybe yeah. tougher issues are yeah. better confronted in such an environment. Um, the zero NRA uh, rating is a great applause line in Evanston. Mm -hmm. It's a problem in a statewide election, isn't it? Um, I think that there are lots of communities in Illinois uh, that have a strong cultural attachment to the exercise of Second Amendment rights, for sure. Um, and I think using rhetoric about that issue that is dismissive or divisive is politically problematic in parts of the state of Illinois. I don't shy away from my rating and my voting record anywhere in the state of Illinois, but I'm also careful everywhere in the state about what sort of rhetoric I use. And I will say this, the public policy agenda pushed by the NRA is in large part influenced not by the preferences of law-abiding gun owners who make up the membership of the NRA, but rather by gun manufacturers for the funding base of the NRA. And so what we have, what those of us who would like to see common sense gun safety laws passed in Springfield, not just talked, as you've said, exactly said, not just talked about in places where it makes us feel good to talk about, but actually passed, we have to figure out a way to talk with law-abiding gun owners who have historically been NRA members and have been proud NRA members about the difference between the interests of law-abiding gun owners and the NRA who just wants to sell as many uh, guns as possible so as to financially benefit their backers. And that wedge is starting to be driven, um, frankly, because of some of the more kind of um, Uh, just kind of uh, visually, graphically grotesque shootings that have happened in the last few years together with some of the NRA's um, obviously self-interested response together with some of the activism that's happened around these issues. And so you can see across the state in polling, as gun ownership hasn't changed much and as the attachment that people who choose to be gun owners have to their right to own guns hasn't changed much, the favorability of the NRA itself has dropped across the state, right? Maybe from in Evanston from 12 points to 2 points, and maybe in some downstate communities from 82 points to 72 points, but nonetheless it's dropped because that, that division is becoming, has been made clear. And so I, I don't, I'm proud of my record on the issue, but I'm also thinking hard, and I believe so far I've been successful in finding ways to talk about the issue that build bridges that we'll be able to use to actually pass legislation. Because I appreciate the question about how do you get Daniel elected in light of this issue, but I'm equally committed to the question of how do we pass common sense legislation that will actually save lives. and that definitely requires us to build those bridges. Yes, um, I think it's important to look at Republicans <laughs> that stand up to Ron. Yeah. I called all 10 representatives who voted to override the veto mm -hmm. and thanked them for their vote. Yeah, thank you for that. They did the right thing. Three or four of them were members of the Republican leadership. That's right. Mm -hmm. So that may have been an extremely difficult vote for them. Yeah. And they're going to catch a lot of wrath for it. And I think it's the same thing. We need to realize that. That you know, we're going to <coughs> rely on that. Yeah. That, I completely agree. And I, first of all, thank you for taking the initiative to do that. You're not the only person who I've heard of doing that. And those of you who feel the same way about that act, which was courageous, uh, might want to consider doing the same thing if you're so inclined. 
let me, let me say a word about it, both to highlight what has happened so far, but also to talk about the way I'm thinking about that for what's gonna, what the world's going to look like in January of 2019. Um, Bruce Rauner has, I mean, listen, Bruce Rauner has replaced the funding mechanism of the Illinois Republican Party. The Republican Party in Illinois, state legislative candidates across the state are now financed by Bruce Rauner personally, Ken Griffin personally, and Richard Uline personally. And that's it. And he has been disgustingly blunt and direct about his expectations about what he's going to get in exchange for those contributions. It's been remarkable. He's been just willing to say, listen, I'm, I've got this money in the bank. You all are going to do what I want. If you don't, I'm going to run against you. Good luck dealing with that. By the way, he then made good on that promise once. Sam McCann, who's a state senator from the Central Park of Illinois, um, had the temerity to vote his conscience and his district once, and therefore against the governor. And Rauner ran somewhat against him and spent millions and millions of dollars to drag Sam through the mud and defeat him, and failed. He failed. Now here's the, the frustrating part about it. Other Republicans saw that Sam was successful in getting reelected, and that might have emboldened them, but they also saw that he was brought to hell and back on the way to re-election, and so it was sort of a mixed message. In any case, for two full years, as the state endured without a budget, as schools were constantly in peril of not opening, as community colleges and universities were dismantled, faculty leaving, students lacking all of a sudden the ability to pay <coughs> high school students moving out of state to attend college and university if they could afford to do so, in other cases just not going at all. Social service agencies closing, more people homeless, mentally ill, no longer receiving treatment, $11 million of debt being added every day, the state careening toward being the first state in history to have junk bond status. As this was happening, there was a really ugly fight going on between Bruce Rauner and Mike Madigan. And other people in the state capitol were trying to figure out a way around it, a way to get some kind of sane budget. And eventually, Madigan was kind of dragged along by his caucus. And by the way, there's an untold story of the bravery of House Democratic members who pulled Madigan along to a reasonable position. It took a while. And that was done by rank and file members on the Democratic side, too. And then Rauner never, of course, got to a reasonable position. That's not his style. And so it took uh, 10 members of the Republican caucus of the House to override his veto. By the way, the veto only happened because 15 voted for the bill the first time. The number, the difference between 15 and 10 is also a little window into the kind of pressure and threats that Rauner is able to issue. So those members of the House um, did a really bold thing. And many of them are frightened that there's going to be primaries run against them financed by the governor. And it'll be very important for us to watch what happens in those primaries. Will the constituents say, you got to be with the governor no matter what? Or will they say, thank you for standing with us. Thank you for, for instance, in a community where that is entirely economically reliant on a public university that is being taken apart. Thank you for investing in our community and keeping our local economy moving along. We'll see what happens in those races. But I want us to also pay attention to who those folks were because when I become governor in January of 2019, we're going to need to work with everybody. And frankly, the Republican members of the legislature are going to be figuring out sort of, OK, Rounder's gone. Now, what kind of landscape do we have in front of us? What kind of opportunity is there to be a part of a new coalition? I think those folks who have the courage to stand up against Rounder will be a lot of the natural people to begin going to to build that coalition to enact bold policies that are going to be um, politically difficult for a lot of people but utterly necessary for the state of Illinois. You, you were next there. And the, yep. Um, no matter how you answer this question, I'm still going to vote for it. That sounds extremely ominous. I was, <laughs> I was talking to Solomon and Lily yesterday. Oh. We missed you yesterday by like 10 minutes. I believe the uh, Mexican restaurant. Oh, sorry about that. Anyway, so uh, we're, we're debating like in a debate. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's going to happen in Democratic debate. And these, these guys are probably going to go after you for raising our taxes. Mm -hmm. how, so as moderators say, so Mr. Biss, how do you, you know, 
whatever the question is, how do you reply to that? You know? Yeah, and, thank and, you for that. It's, it's going to be a hard question. It's a the first question. Do you and I, I, I almost feel like I planted you because I was about yeah. to answer that question in yeah. response to the previous question, but just to like, you know, pull, pull, pull you all behind the curtain for a second. I'm working to shorten my answers these days. So I didn't want to do a whole other bit to the previous question. But, but now you allow me to, to do the, the uh, appendix. Um, and here goes. So listen, I voted for this budget, which included a tax increase of 1.2 percentage points. And that was probably a very dumb political decision for a guy running for governor. And frankly, I don't care. The state was burning, and I was not going to make a self-interested political decision to vote to continue that burning because I want to be governor. I'm just not going to be that guy. But I will also say, and it was nice of everyone to clap when Elisa talked about how we now have a budget, and you know, against the status quo of not having a budget, that's a perfectly good thing to clap for. But this was an exercise of you know taking the bar and lowering it, and then lowering it again, and then lowering it one more time, and then dropping it on the floor, and then still somehow tripping over it as you walk <laughs> past it. This is not the budget that the state of Illinois should have in the long term. This is a budget that we should be relieved to have because it's better than literally allowing the bleeding to continue. But there's a lot wrong with it. The most important thing wrong with this budget is that our tax system in Illinois is genuinely regressive. And by the way, to your question, Democrats should talk loudly about taxes by fleeing the tax issue. We have neglected to say what Democrats and progressives should say strongly and loudly and believe passionately and the people of Illinois know, which is that our tax system is very unfair. Illinois has the fourth or fifth most regressive tax system of any state in the union, of any state in the union. And what the budget that was just passed does is retains the current tax system with its regressivity, with its unfairness, and solves the problem like a math problem in a spreadsheet. What we ought to be doing in the long term is to fix our unfair, broken tax system. And that begins, there's many steps to that, but that begins by amending the Constitution to allow us to have a progressive income tax. Right now, Illinois is one of only four states in the union whose Constitution says you have to have a flat tax, whose Constitution says you may not ask someone making $20 million a year to pay a higher tax rate than someone making $20,000 a year. Only four states that do this. And the others, by the way, include Michigan, which is not, you know, in the Fiscal Management Hall of Fame, <laughs> and Pennsylvania, which last year was the second to last state in the union to get a budget. We, of course, surpassed them by taking infinity time <laughs> to get a budget. Uh, this is not a reasonable way to run a tax system. It has harmed our ability to find adequate revenue, but it's also just harmed our ability to have a basically fair system, right? Over the course of the last several generations, the great majority of economic growth has gone to the very top, as people in the middle and the bottom have not gotten a raise, and yet we're not able to access this money without taxing the people who haven't gotten a raise. It's the wrong way to do things. And so, over the long term, the right answer on taxes is to acknowledge, as Democrats, that our income tax system, definitely our property tax system, and to some extent, even our sales tax system, are not fair, are not as progressive as they should be, and we've got to fix those if we want the right budget for the people of Illinois. So many hands. Um, <laughs> Russ over here. Okay, well, you commented that Republicans, to some degree, have to fear Browner and his fundraising issues. Same thing somewhat applies to Democrats and Madigan, who controls a lot of the purse constraints. The difference there is that we can vote Browner out, we can't vote Madigan out. Yep. So, what's your position with respect to that? Uh, well, my position with respect to the specific issue you raise is I totally agree that it's a problem for someone to accrue as much power as Madigan has had without us having the ability to vote him out. And that's why one of the first things I did in the legislature in, back in 2011 was I put in a constitutional amendment that says you cannot serve as Speaker of the House for more than 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Because... <laughs> because he has used that longevity as a tool to accrue more and more power. Every year, giving more favors, having more people owe him, cutting more deals, and finding himself in a situation with more and more power. And yet, as you say, he's only accountable to the voters of his own district, which is less than 1% of the state of Illinois. That's a bad system, and I've fought to change it. And I'm not, again, I'm not just saying that now because it's kind of a cool thing to say when you're running for governor in 2017 and he's become so unpopular. I started knocking on doors in 2007 saying that and tried to act on it as soon as I arrived in the legislature. Um, I'll also say this. As you might imagine from someone who started saying that when he first began knocking on doors and running for the legislature, if Madigan had his way, I never would have become a state rep in the first place. 
He did his best to stop me back in 2010 when I first won, and he was unsuccessful. If he has his way now, I won't become governor. I think he's going to be unsuccessful there too. But even though that's the case, and even though I have been on the opposite side of pretty close to every inter-party battle that I can think of from Mike Madigan during the course of my time in public service, I have always sought ways to work with everybody, including him. And I think this is a, a, a very important thing for us to say. We want, I believe, a candidate for governor who is clear about what's wrong with Mike Madigan, who's clear about how our party needs to reform itself if it's going to actually be a party that enacts policies that's good for the people of Illinois, but also who's willing to work with everyone, who's not going to be about demonizing people, who's not going to create yet another nuclear war environment in Springfield. Because while I might agree with a few of Browner's critiques of Madigan, the fact that he's chosen to approach it in a way that makes any kind of collaboration impossible is a real catastrophe for the state of Illinois. So I've tried throughout my career to walk that line, to always stay true to what I believe to be true and to be loud and critical about what my own party and the leader of my own party should be doing differently, but to make those criticisms in a way to make collaboration still possible because without collaboration, we're all going to sink together. Um, I was wondering if you can elaborate on your idea of what a progressive tax means. Um, there were many groups in the morning Quinn's time that went to Springfield to discuss issues, i.e. one with teachers' pensions, mm -hmm. and two, the connection to the tax system, and how that's really an adjust in that and so many other things. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on what you see of progressive taxes being? Because there's some information out there that people are using Got it. So, so here's what I would say about this. The, the Illinois income tax rate right now is 4.95%. That's 4.95% on everybody, whether you're earning, as I said earlier, $20 million a year or $20,000 a year. And, you know, a month ago it was 3.75%. A couple years before that it was 5%. A couple years before that, four years before that it was 3%. The rates are the same for everybody. Now, there are some, if you, let's look at the states around us, right? If you look at, for example, Wisconsin, their lowest tax bracket is lower than our 4.95%. 4, 4 but their top tax bracket, which kicks in, I believe, at $365,000 of annual income, is well north of 7%. And so they found a way to bring in, in aggregate, significantly more revenue per capita than we do, but that top bracket doesn't kick in until someone's making over $365,000 a year. So for instance, if you were, let's say, to import that Wisconsin tax code into Illinois, what you would find is the state would have $10 billion more per year, and yet you have this, the lower bracket is actually lower than our lowest, than our bracket. And so the, there are some who have said, once you amend the Constitution, to enable for progressive taxation, that's just code for you're going to raise everybody's taxes. And what I would say is, it's not code for anything. It's just a fundamental belief that as the economy changes and as society changes, the tax code has got to follow. And if it is the case, as it is the case right now, that the top 1% earn a much greater share of income than they historically have earned in this country, then we've got to have the tools at our disposal in state government to allow our tax code to follow that reality and tax where the money is. And so, you know, do I have a specific balanced budget approach with a specific tax, tax set of tax brackets out there that I'm running on right now? I don't because fundamentally I think all that has to be worked out and has to be arranged by people sitting down at a table. Um, I'm happy to lay out um, there, you know, we, we've been playing around with this. We found a tax structure that we were able to design that would be compared to right now it would raise 600 million more dollars. It would, it would constitute neutrality or a decrease in burden for everybody making under, I think it was $300,000 a year. And yet the top bracket would still not be higher than surrounding states. So there is a tremendous amount of room. You don't need to, if you don't want to, follow California to 12 and 13% tax brackets. You don't need to have the higher brackets go all the way down to $15,000 a year, as some critics suggest. There's tremendous room to bend, build genuine fairness into the system and still bring in more revenue to enable us to have a budget that works. And the fact that we have not had that tool at our disposal is, I think, just been handcuffs for the policymaking process in Springfield. If you look at 
other blue states that have been successful in tackling their fiscal problems, all of them have used as one of several tools progressive taxation. And the fact that we don't have it has just been an anvil around our neck, and I think it's got to be changed. Jason is next. Um, I think a lot of the problem is a function of language. Yeah. People hear progressive, regressive, and they get this picture in their head of, oh, if you're progressive, you're a Democrat, or that's a Democratic issue, mm -hmm. or progressive. And I think some of the problem we run into is that by using that sort of language, it either shuts people down completely, it's like, I'm not going to listen, or they just don't understand. You know, I'll use right to work as an example. Yeah, I think right that's a does not mean what I mean, it sounds like it means. It sounds great. But people don't understand that it doesn't mean what it sounds like. I think using terms like progressive and regressive is part of the problem that we're running into. Yeah, I think that's totally right. And I think, I think that's a little bit of a trap that we fall into. And what we should say is that our tax system isn't fair, which people feel and know. And then if the response might be, come on, Daniel, that's, that's subjective. And what I would say is, OK, here's an example. Check this one out. If you're in the bottom quintile in Illinois, don't even say quick time. Twenty percent. I love quick time, man. Sounds like reptile. Uh, <laughs> so much better than reptile. Um, if, if you're in the bottom fifth um, in Illinois, you're paying in state and local taxes thirteen percent of your income. If you're in the bottom, you're paying 13%. If you're in the top, you're paying 4%. If you're in the bottom, you're paying 13. If you're in the top, you're paying 4. That is nobody's idea of fair. That is nobody's idea of fair. And I think if you just lay that out, you can say our tax system is unfair. And by the way, as Democrats, we've been sort of scared to talk about it because the Democrats know that when they start talking about taxes, people get nervous. No, we've got to lean into it and explain that that is completely unfair. It's punishing the middle class. It's punishing the poor. And it's time to fix it. Thank you, Andrea. Is there potential to put the referendum back on the ballot of a fair binding referendum about a fair tax system? Um, well, I don't think it's going to happen right now. Um, I think that the way we're going to get this done is we're going to build a movement that's prepared to fight on this issue. We're going to win a governor's race, and then this will be the first priority. And then to put that referendum on the ballot requires 36 votes in the Senate, which we have today. Which we have today. 71 votes in the House, which we don't have today, but it's not like we've got 45. We're in the mid to high 60s. We need, let's say, five, six more votes. And so it's going to be about convincing those last five or six people that if we want to claim to be enacting a fair tax policy, they've got to take this vote. And there's going to be pressure from the Chamber of Commerce. There's going to be pressure from big donors. But there's also going to be a moment, as I alluded to earlier, where people in the legislature with this new post rounder era are going to be looking around to figure out who they are and what they can do differently. And I think that moment of transition is going to be a unique opportunity to do bold things. And that's why we need a governor who's not just going to say theoretically they're for this, but is going to say, hey, I'm going to fight for this fast, because I understand that this has been the number one structural error in the Illinois government that has stopped us from making the kind of progress we need to make. You in the back or next. Um, I read, I research, that Illinois is really the problem. And that there's Yeah. Let me, um, uh, Jason wants to speak up here too. Uh, let, let, me, um, let me give you an example. First of all, your, the fact that you allude to is, is a real fact. We have 7,000-ish units of government in Illinois. By the way, it's sort of even hard to know how many. So by some counts we have, I think, 6,800. By other counts we have 8,400. But the most reliable count of these hard to keep track of entities <coughs> is uh, about 7,000 different units of government. Mosquito abatement districts and drainage districts and, of course, you know, the city of Evanston and so forth. So let me give you an example. 1,400 or so of these are townships. Of those 1,400 townships, 
20 uh, were what's called coterminous, which means they, I have trouble at least if I move this. Okay. I don't want to like ruin the branding, but I also just feel like sort of lonely there. What's that? I got the picture already. Ah, excellent. Um, <coughs> Oh, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still going. I'm sorry, but you're, you're next. I promise. Um, so, there were 20 townships that were coterminous with the city, which means the same exact plot of land as the city. Evanston was one of those. And the city government came to me and said, Daniel, we don't think this is working efficiently. We're going to run a advisory referendum and see what the community wants. And the community said, in the non-binding referendum, we'd like to merge the township in with the city government. And so then. I had to go pass a bill to make that happen, which actually was sort of bizarrely difficult to do, but I was able, through some machinations, to get that bill passed and signed, which then allowed for another referendum to be run, an advisory referendum on, um, a non-advisory referendum on whether the township should be consolidated in with the city, and that referendum passed, and the township was consolidated in. But so here's, here's what happened. The main function of the township was the provision of general assistance grants, which are grants to families that really need them. It's a very important program. In the last year they existed, they provided about a half a million dollars in those grants. Now, they also spent a quarter of a million dollars in administrative overhead. So if you're a progressive, you might think that's a quarter million dollars we should be putting in the hands of families who need them. If you're a conservative, you might say we should just put that in tax relief, but either way, probably not the best use of this quarter million dollars. And so that township government has been folded in with the city and they're on the way to repurposing that money to a better place. But it's not just that. And this is important. And to me, this is actually the most important part of this discussion. It's also the case that, as you might imagine, the city's public health department serves a lot of families who also have needs from general assistance. And now that those two functions both exist under the same roof, the general assistance folks can go to the public health folks and vice versa and compare notes and let families need, become aware of the services that are also available. And so there's been a better quality of government service provided to families in Evanston in need of help. And so to me, this is an opportunity not just to make government more efficient, which is important, not just to make government cost less, which is great, but also to make government work better, provide better services, provide more robust services because uh, having so many different silos is a recipe for bad communication and over time it can actually become a recipe for corruption because there's so many different entities many of which aren't being watched closely and so I think that finding the right way to streamline these units of government is important and valuable but I'll also say that the right way to do it is with input from the local community the way this happened was the local elected officials came to me said we want to do this. I said, prove to me the community wants it. Then they ran an advisory referendum. That passed. Then we made it happen. And I think that if we go down this path with a one-size-fits-all, there's kind of a bureaucratic entity in Springfield that just decides which units of government are going to be abolished and which are not, we're going to really, really get in a lot of trouble. What we have to do is engage local stakeholders and find the right way to streamline government. And in my experience, once you engage people in the local community and listen to them, there's a pretty clear direction about, about what the best way to handle our government structure is. There you go. Um, to her point, yep. that perception that Illinois is over-governed is true to the extent about units of government. It came up in my book or from someone who throws my bank taxes. But, and I can't remember the website, but if you search for public employees per capita, mm. you can, there's a website that gives you that. Uh, and we're very low, they're like maybe, I don't know, 43 states have more public employees per population. And it was, so I got to uh, email that. So, yeah. you know, units of government versus how many people would pay more. That's definitely true, and the state government is very, very small per capita by comparison to other states. Uh, you know, we don't have, thank God, we don't have fewer teachers than all other states per capita, <coughs> but we certainly would not we would certainly benefit by having more teachers. So, um, so there's no question that the there's five million different questions you could ask about how much government we have. And I think it's important to be clear about what question you're asking and clear about what question you're answering, um, because if you just paint with a broad brush, it becomes a kind of a libertarian anti-government um, 
just sort of rhetorical game, and that's something that we think I, we I think should not be participating in. Is that a response? Okay. Yeah, and it sort of comes from the fact that O'Hare, there's something called an airport authority, which is its own unit of government, and these are historical entities, and there's important reasons for them, but also, if you're not communicating well, then you wind up with real duplication, and that's not good at all. Um, how do we improve the economy in this state so we won't continue to have population loss? The question is, how do we improve the economy in the state? Is it, Could you repeat yep, the question? The question is, how do we, we improve the economy in the state so we don't continue to have a population loss? So let's, let's start real basic. We cannot bear this kind of budget chaos we've had. It is devastating. It's devastating. If you ask Bruce Rauner, if for some reason you choose to ask Bruce Rauner about his philosophy of government, of, of uh, economic development, he'll say we should have no taxes and no regulations and no unions and everything will be great. And then if you ask, at least when I ask most people who are in fact business owners, you know, if I ask, would you prefer not to pay taxes, they say, sure. If I ask, would you prefer not to be regulated, they say, yeah, no problem, why not? But if I ask, what made you come here, or what's making you think about leaving here, or what made you not come here, the great majority say, the state seems like a basket case. <laughs> and many say to me, we don't even bother analyzing what the situation is like in Illinois right now, because we assume it'll be five times worse in 10 years anyway. So we don't care to assess the tax system now because we assume it'll be triple in 10 years. We don't care to assess the quality of the workforce now because we assume based upon your inability to invest properly in education, it'll be much worse in 10 years. The same with the infrastructure. The kind of unbelievable instability in our fiscal environment is utterly, utterly devastating for our efforts at economic development. And so we need not just to have a budget, though that's a tremendous step in the right direction, we need to have a sustainable long-term budget plan. And so when I keep talking about reforming our tax code so that it's actually in keeping with the modern economy, part of that's about this. Part of that's about saying, if you fix the budget like an arithmetic problem, but it's not really a budget built for the modern economy, then five years from now it's going to be out of whack again anyway, and so no one can have any faith that they can rely on the current level of services being sustainable over time. So that this, to me, is the most important thing, and it's crucial. It's just crucial. Next, let's be honest. There are quite a few places in Illinois that are booming. There are quite a few places in Illinois that are struggling beyond belief. Places that are struggling from a complete lack of economic opportunity, places that are struggling with a completely inadequate level of educational opportunity, and places that are struggling with a vicious and unlivable level of violence. And that's a giant problem. Long, lot can be said about that, but let's begin here. There, the state government has essentially walked away from a lot of the state and has acted as though we don't really believe in a lot of the state, has allowed generations of disinvestment to persist, where a school is closed and then a manufacturing plant leaves and then social service agencies are shuttered and there are fewer and fewer job opportunities and so people who have the resources to go do and it's a downward spiral of disinvestment. The way to reverse this is not with a theory, it's not with a program, it's not with a job training course somewhere, it's with investment. Money has been pulled out of neighborhoods for a generation, we have to directly put money in neighborhoods. We have to directly hire people. Over time, that can act as a spark that will allow for more uh, organic private sector growth to happen, but it's got to start with the public sector stepping in and directly putting people to work in the communities that have been the victims of generations of dis disinvestment and systematic lack of economic opportunity. And by the way, the most significant way the state has historically done this is with the capital bill, with construction projects. 
And that's really important. But what have we done way too often? What have we done way too often? We've said, here's a neighborhood with a need of job opportunities, and so we're going to do construction projects in that neighborhood. And we're going to bring people from somewhere else to work on them. We've got to put a stop to that. And that's something that we have talked about for a long time, but we haven't been willing to really honestly face up to. And so when I'm governor, and we're trying to pass a capital bill to do investment in infrastructure projects, I'm not going to sign it unless it clearly solves that problem with real, real teeth. The last thing I want to say to our friend Bruce Rauner's philosophy about, uh, about getting rid of all the taxes and all the regulations is that what we have in Illinois is a system that has been run by a few. And so what does that mean when it comes to tax policy? It means that if you're a big corporation who's got the ability to hire the right lobbyists and come to Springfield with the right lobbyists and pound the table and threaten to leave the state, if you don't get a special tax break, you get taken care of. And then what happens to that money that you're no longer paying? That burden gets shifted to everybody else. And so it's harder for small businesses, it's, smart, it's harder for entrepreneurs, it's harder for young companies. The system is set up to benefit the large and existent in favor of the rest. The regulatory system is the same way in many respects. Regulations are written by existing big companies for existing big companies that makes it harder to start new businesses, harder for new people to enter into fields because, hey, if I'm already there and successful, I don't want competition. And if I'm already there and successful, I'm usually able to hire the right lobbyists to write the rules to make sure I don't get competition. And so instead of focusing on a race to the bottom of no taxes and no regulations, we should be focusing on a level playing field and making sure the rules are written knowing that our economy will do best if the business that doesn't yet exist is playing by the same rules as the business that is hiring 5,000 people. And I, I think that there's a remarkable amount of opportunity that's not just consistent with progressive values, but advances progressive values to rewrite our tax and regulatory system that will be fairer, more of a level playing field, and then allow for a lot more innovation and entrepreneurship. You were next. I was going to ask a two-part question. One, in terms of opportunities, I'm thinking education. Um, where is SB1, mm -hmm. and what, what is it going to take to get that bill to, you know, regarding the distribution of funds to schools passed by the end of this month? so that schools are ready to open and do what they need. And two, um, I asked you some years ago about the park test and Pearson Education Group, and I'm wondering where you stand on, I, I think they're a huge example of one of the problems with privates coming in and taking over our public education, um, and now trying to have say in which teachers are certified, et cetera. Where do you stand on, on that in terms of funding our public schools or charter schools or how to fix this big mess? Great, so let's start with SB1. Um, I'm guessing not everybody knows the ins and outs of this particular nightmare embedded in the Illinois government right now. Is, no, 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 okay. So Senate Bill 1 is a bill that's currently on its way to the governor's desk, and it is what I would characterize as a important but fundamentally modest uh, improvement to our school funding formula. The governor has threatened to veto this bill because I swear I'm not making this up, I swear I'm not making this up. He's threatened to veto this bill because he agrees with 90% of it. <laughs> He's very bad at democracy. So it's a real shame if he vetoes the bill because the bill is a modest improvement to a system that requires dramatic improvements. And we can talk more about later, more later about why this is an improvement and why there's a lot more, much more than, than this does that remains to be done. But there's also a, a more urgent problem, frankly, which is that the budget that was passed, and of course does release funding for schools, it says that funding in fact doesn't get released unless Senate Bill 1 or something similar to it is signed. Hmm. And so if the governor vetoes that bill and nothing else happens, then the school funding doesn't get released and there will be plenty of schools that in the next month are unable to open. So we're trying to persuade the governor to have a change of heart. He has not, generally speaking, throughout his career as governor, <laughs> indicated a lot of openness and flexibility to new ideas. So I'm frankly skeptical that he would sign it. My gut tells me that he'll veto it, that the Senate will have the votes to override the veto, that the, the battle will shift to the House. And if I frankly had to predict, I'm not sure at all, but if I had to predict, I would predict that the House will not have the votes to override the veto. Hopefully I'm wrong. But if I'm right, then we're going to have to rush to Springfield and do something else uh, reasonably similar, but something that the governor is willing to sign on to. And 
My guess is we'll be able to do it simply because the universal desire that everybody shares for schools to open, but know this, this is not the best way to run a government, it's not the best way to run a school system. We really ought to be not rushing to Springfield at the 11th hour as the schools are about to not open. We ought to be thinking about the right way to fund a school system in Illinois. And the right way to fund a school system is not to be the most property tax reliant state of any state in the union. That's where we are today. We are more reliant on property taxes to fund schools than any other state in the union, a fact that Senate Bill 1 would not even improve. And so we need to have the big, bold, politically difficult, but essential conversation about how to restructure our tax system. So we're not so reliant on property taxes. So our income taxes are just are levied in a fair way that is not unfairly burdening the middle class and that allows our schools to be funded properly. And all this is doable. What we do in Illinois is truly unusual. So there are 49 states that we could learn from and dozens of states we could learn a lot from, but unfortunately we've not had the courage to do that yet. Uh, so to your other question, yeah, the, the, the relationship between the park test and the private um, profit motive is really instructive here, right? So state governments got together in a, in a public sector context to think about how to devise a common set of um, Standards, I suppose, is one way to put them, the Common Core. And there's a lot to say about the Common Core. I think there's an awful lot uh, that's really important, not just in the concept, but in the specific execution of the Common Core. But then the entities that are brought in to assess whether those standards are being met are a private company, and there's been nothing but trouble, frankly, in the implementation of that. Now, when the park test was first kind of Plan. There were dozens of states that were going to be a part of it. States have been falling out. Illinois is now one of a pretty small number of states that are still in it. If you talk to our local uh, schools here in Evanston, I think they would say that it's been frustrating and problematic, but something that they're kind of willing to work with and try to improve, and I'm committed to work with them to try to improve it. But let's just take a step back here. Putting the profit motive into the middle of the education system is a bad idea, period. And the consequences that arise from stepping in that direction almost universally tend to be bad. And so this is a fight that we have to fight when it comes to testing. It's a fight when you have to fight when it comes to outsourcing of other services. It's a fight we have to fight when it comes to charters. It's a fight we have to fight in other contexts of government too. I was just involved in the battle with Governor Rauner who wanted to privatize the nursing services in the prison system. Right? In Illinois, thank God, is a state that does not allow private prisons but we allow privatization of services in the prison system. Why is that a good idea? What does that profit motive going to do to our criminal justice policies? How does that make sense? It makes no sense. And so we have to resist this privatization. We have to resist this idea that the private sector, which works very well to provide certain services to certain people based upon where the profit is there to be found, we have to resist the notion that that's the right way to do government, which means providing universal services to everybody, regardless of where the profit is to be found. Different thing. Follow up on the property taxes. I, I'm pretty sure in some communities they would have a card system. Is that something that's going to be in I don't, frankly. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think. It's not socialist, or whatever you want to call it. No, I, I just think that public schools are public. Right. And I, I think that we need to figure out a tax system that gets the money in a way that's fair, in a way that asks people who can afford to pay to pay their share, in a way that doesn't ask people who can't afford to pay to pay more than their share, and then use the money to run government. Right. And I, I think that, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a radical about this. I think it's fine for the Park District Swimming Pool to charge a fee. But the idea that public schools are sort of public but also charge $1,000 of tuition, I know it's not called tuition, but same difference, I don't, I don't, that doesn't sit right with me. And I, I think that what we've done is we've built a tax system that's so unfair, that burdens the wrong people so much, that we've then given up on using it to raise revenue to run government, and instead we've tried to nickel and dime people other ways. Well, you've got to fix the tax system and stop relying so much on property taxes, period. 
and stop accepting a situation where the bottom pays 13% and the top pays 4%, write a tax system that works for the people of Illinois, and then use it to fund a government that provides services for the people of Illinois. I've ridden my bike through Jackson, Alexander, Pulaski, Union County. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there. I mean, nothing. I mean, for a biker, there are a lot of hills compared to here. Well, yeah, well, I'm swamp. <laughs> the state has an obligation to at least set a floor mm -hmm. for schools in those areas. Yeah, yeah listen, the, the, there are parts of rural southern Illinois that have been left behind by the state of Illinois. Whether it's about funding schools, whether it's about creating economic opportunity, whether it's about funding other aspects of public infrastructure, it's wrong. It's just wrong. And like I said, I think the state's behavior makes it seem as though the state has just given up on certain communities. And of course, politicians never say they're giving up, but they act as though they are. We've got to reverse that. We can't accept that. We can't accept that. What, what is your strategy to win, like, the whole state of Illinois? <laughs> <laughs> what, so, I, uh, how long do you have? Um, and do you, are you concerned more about the primary or the general election or both? I guess both, you know, just generally. So, in terms of my strategy to win the whole state of Illinois, I want to go back to the previous question for a second. I think that the state has turned its back on a lot of regions in Illinois. I think the Democratic Party has turned its back on a lot of regions in Illinois too. I think the Democratic Party, thank you. I think the Democratic Party has become so obsessed with so-called swing districts that if your house district is between 45 and 55 percent Democratic, you are lavished with attention. But if it's 75% Democratic, you're ignored, which means we write off our base, we take our base for granted, and that's wrong. And if you're 25% Democratic, you're ignored too, which means we write off other parts of the state as well, which is also wrong. And so I just don't believe in that. And I don't believe in that, frankly, I'll get to the campaign and my philosophy of government, but I also don't believe in that tactically, because let's think about it for a second. Let's say there's a part of the state that's 35% Democratic, and so, there's no willingness to help someone run for state rep in that district because they're not going to get more than 35%. And we give up. And there's no activism happening. No one is talking to voters or community leaders about how the Democratic Party ought to be trying to help that region of the state. Well, that 35% is going to eventually become 30 if that's your approach. If instead you find a talented candidate and you support her when she wants to go door to door and neighbor to neighbor and talk about what the Democratic Party has to offer, and maybe you help her find some volunteers to do that with her. And then the next thing you know, there's activists who are working on community issues. And they're working with the local school board on progressive issues that help the community have a better life. And then maybe pretty soon one of those activists runs for school board and is on the school board. Doesn't necessarily run on the Democratic ticket, because school boards are nonpartisan, but is a Democrat, is a progressive, and is able to run and win and be a part of government. Well, probably two years later, that 35% is going to become 38, and then 40, and then 42. And a decade later, you've built yourself a swing district by including people, by reaching out, by being a true grassroots party that has a presence everywhere. That's the party that I think we need to have. And so in this campaign, I'm doing a few things to make sure we have that kind of candidacy, which after the primary will become the, really the face of the Democratic Party. We're holding organizing meetings in every corner of the state. So I, I sent an email out to sort of a small part of our volunteer list saying who wants to host an organizing meeting for our campaign. And we got over 100 responses instantly. And my first thought was, that's fantastic. Oh my goodness. And my second thought was, oh no, what if 98 of them are from Evanston? <laughs> <laughs> and my third thought was, hooray, 98 of them aren't from Evanston. Uh, they're from all over. They're all over. And so we've held these organizing meetings. You know, some with as many as 80 people, some with as few as five, I'll be honest with you, but most, mostly with several dozen people, 25, 30, 35 people, led by a local passionate volunteer who rents out the local coffee shop or a room in the library and invites their friends, and our campaign supports them to invite people who we know are potentially interested in the region. They sit around and they talk. Yeah, they talk about how they're going to knock on doors to get me elected, and I'm glad they're talking about that, but they also talk about how our campaign needs to listen in that community, how our campaign needs to learn from that community, how our campaign needs to present a kind of agenda that will lift that community up. I think that kind of engagement is crucial. I think that kind of engagement 
is necessary if we're going to have a party that actually listens and pays attention and then based upon what it's paid attention to adjusts its agenda for the entire state and the entire country. I think if we had that kind of party two years ago and one year ago, we would have had a different outcome in the election in November of 2016. Let me also, well, okay, uh, I think you're next and then we'll go to you. So continuing that same question, could I bring this specifically back to you as a candidate? Yep. Okay, so I've gone to, we've had several of these events now and I've, I've listened to Pritzker, I've listened to Pawar, and I've listened to Duck. Mm -hmm. And um, Amir Pawar in particular, <coughs> He's got a specific slogan, New Deal for Illinois. Mm -hmm. He lists off, here's the five things that that entails. Mm -hmm. So as you as a candidate, you know, that type of thing is what I could talk to my friends about. Mm -hmm. They ask me, what does Daniel Biss stand for? So what is your sort of elevator speech like that, that we, you know, if we want to support you, we take on yeah. and talk to our friends about? In terms of policy, it starts with fixing our unfair tax system. None of the other things that anybody else wants to do can be done unless we're willing to fix our unfair tax system first. That was the original sin that got us to this moment. The next thing we have to do, the next thing we have to do is to have a school funding system that works. Right now we don't have that. We don't have a school funding system that creates educational opportunity everywhere in the state. And we can't do it, by the way, without fixing our tax system. So to me, that's, that's the next thing. It's you fix our tax system first, you fix our school funding system. And then you have to work on a multi-pronged level or on a way to create job opportunities. Part of that's what we've talked about, which is investment directly in communities. But part of that is also creating the social supports that enable people to work. And that means universal child care, sick leave, and family leave, so that anybody in any kind of family structure has the ability to have a healthy family and be able to work. And these are all things that are doable and they're concrete and they're real. And they've been around forever. They're not, they're not new or different. But the vision in Springfield has been so cramped that there hasn't really been a willingness to take them on. And so that brings me to the last thing that I would put in the elevator speech, which is we've got to fix our campaign finance system. I passed a bill out of the Senate to create a system of small donor matching, a system that if it were enacted, it would lift up the voices of ordinary donors and campaigns, people who give 5 and 10 and $25, and depress the influence of the very, very rich big donors as well as corporate money. This is something that has actually been enacted in New York City, and when they enacted it in New York, it instantly transformed their city council. The council got younger, it got less white, it got less male, it got more politically independent, and it got much more progressive. Because they got more like the public. And I think that to do the other things that many of the candidates are talking about, it will be utterly necessary to transform our politics as well. And the only way to do that is to change our policies to pull the pernicious influence of money out of our system. And to me, if we can't get that done, we're going to have a lot of trouble doing everything else as well. So I have a lot, there's a lot to say about the campaigns, but if you want the policy elevator speech, I would say those are the four things I would start with. Yeah, I think that's important for talking about winning the rest of the state. I think mm -hmm. it is important to have a policy elevator speech, mm -hmm. sort of, you know, make it very clear these are the plans, because mm -hmm. that's what some of the other candidates are. Mm -hmm. Great. Jerry? Yeah. That gentleman there has been trying oh, to ask the question for a very long time. <laughs> from, from a specific to a universal, Berrios is the Cook County Assessor. Mm -hmm. Berrios takes money from the lawyers that appear before him on appeal. Do you have legislation that would fix that? I do have legislation that would fix that. Um, so I, the, the property tax assessment system in Cook County, and frankly in other parts of Illinois too, though not all of Illinois, yeah. is really, really broke. Yeah. Really just wrong. And so I don't know how many of you all read the Tribune series about this. But Berrios is also up for re-election next year too. That is true. The Tribune series in this was really pretty remarkable. It was pretty remarkable. Basically what it said is this. The property tax assessment system is consistently biased, not just randomly wrong, but consistently biased against the middle class and against the poor, consistently. This is knowable. This is about numbers. And those numbers were known, they were studied, they were analyzed, and he got told how to fix it. He was given a model to fix it, 
He said, oh look, this will fix it, this is great. He put out a press release bragging about how he was going to fix it, and then after putting out the press release, he figured out who fixing it would upset. <laughs> and then he put the solution in a drawer and locked the drawer and hoped nobody was going to notice. And so this system is just totally unacceptable. It's wrong and it's immoral. And by the way, the appeal process, to your point, makes it worse, not better. Because of the politically connected people who participate in the appeal process, and frankly because, on average, people with fewer means are less likely to appeal and have less access, certainly, to uh, politically connected lawyers to help with their appeals. And so I put in legislation that has a multi-pronged, really aggressive approach to this. So first of all, transparency. And it sounds like a small thing, but it's important. If you want to know exactly how your property was assessed the way it was assessed, you can't figure that out. They won't tell you. They won't tell you. And they will acknowledge that lots of the properties are reassessed by what they call hand checks. They're done by hand after the model spits out the number it spits out. And they won't say how those hand checks are arrived at or why, or how they select which ones get hand checked. It's as if, instead of filling out a tax return to calculate your income taxes, you just got a letter from the IRS saying, you know, you're 43 years old, you live in this zip code, so we think you owe us $13,976, send us a check. And you would say, well, that, that's not right. And they'd say, okay, all right, all right. We'll ask your neighbors what they owe, and then you get a letter back saying, okay, now it's 12,000, now send us a check. But there's never an explanation, and if you disagree with the answer, you never get to look under the hood and see what was done. So number one, transparency. Number two, we have to use these modern models. And what my bill says is if the county assessor or a township assessor is unwilling to fit with international standards about fairness and accuracy that rely on these new models, then they just get the power of assessment taken away from them. They essentially lose, they effect lose their right to be the assessor. And I can guarantee you that level of hammer will guarantee that they'll, they'll shape up their act. And then finally, on the ethics front, the campaign contributions to the assessor from the property tax attorneys, it's a crazy way to run a system. It's a crazy way to run a system. And so what my bill does is simply puts those um, contributions under the same pay-to-play ordinances that already have been in effect for other parts of Cook County government. And so I have legislation that I think on a number of different levels would genuinely tackle this problem. And it's really unconscionable that we have dealt with this for so long. Where is that bill? That bill is awaiting a hearing in the Senate. So stay tuned. What's the number? Uh, I believe it's Senate Bill 475. Um, but if that's not right, send me an email and I'll, I'll I'm okay. pretty sure it's 475. Yep. Um, question about the pension debt. And the numbers are just staggering. They look like yeah. the Defense Department. And, and what are we going to do about it? So the question is, what are you going to do about the pension debt, which is as big as the Defense Department, though thank God not quite. Um, <laughs> So Illinois owes more pension debt, more, more to its pensions than any other state in the union. We owe per capita or just? Uh, per capita. Okay. Um, so we owe $130 million just on the state systems alone. Sorry. Billion. Yeah. Billion, yeah. thank you. Just on the state systems alone. So the question is, why? What happened? And so we talked about this for a minute earlier, right? The first question you might ask is, do we have more public employees than everybody else? No, we don't. And the next question you might ask is, do we have more generous pensions than everybody else? The answer there is also no, we don't. In fact, since 2011, we have less generous pensions than everybody else. But until 2011, we were mostly in line with similar states. And so the question is, how, how did this happen? And the answer is that we, for generations, Generations were the best in the country at not making our pension payments. <clears throat> and one year it would be, oh, we don't quite have the money this year because revenue came in low. Another year it would be, oh, we want to expand programmatic spending in some other area and we want to use the money we would have put in the pension system. Another year it was, oh, we've got this great plan. We're going to put in place a 50-year payment ramp and it'll be designed to make sure that the payments are low until the people who wrote that policy are retired and it worked, and now here we are. But for generations, we've just not made the proper payments into our pension systems, and so that's left us where they are. 
By the way, there's one pension system in Illinois that receives the required payments every year. That's the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund. And it re receives the required payments not because somebody's a good Samaritan, but because the law says it has to, and the law is enforceable. The Texas teachers' pension system is the same way. Their constitution says they've got to make the payment, and they do, and they're in fine shape. So no matter what, what we have to do is make sure the payments get made. And even now, even now, with the Illinois pension debt making international headlines, Bruce Rauner still, every year, is trying to figure out a new way to pay less now and force someone else to pay more later. So we can't have that. And I will tell you, as governor, I will sign a budget that doesn't properly fund the pension system. But I'll also tell you that it's not really enough to rely on my goodwill. We have to put a structure in place to guarantee the payment is made annually. And then I would say, having done that, what we ought to do is try to find agreed upon collaborative constitutional ways to fix other aspects of the system that are anomalous. So one example that I give a lot is that there are 628 different pension systems in Illinois. So Evanston has two, one for firefighters, one for police officers. Every other town in Illinois also has two. There's only one other state in the union that has more than us. That's Pennsylvania. Florida's got like two thirds as many and no other state besides Florida has even half. And so what that results in, by the way, Evanston's are, in, are well run for a variety of reasons, partially because we have good government in Evanston, but partially also because there's a lot of people who live in Evanston who are knowledgeable in these fields, and many of them get appointed to serve on the board together with the um, active participants and the retirees. But a lot of these pension systems are much smaller than Evanston's. That results in much less efficiency. It results in investments that can't possibly perform as well because such a large percentage of the assets have to be liquid. It results in frankly, in some cases, possibilities of corruption as well. It's just a, a wrong way to run this. And what Ohio did in 1965 with a similar situation is they consolidated all these pension systems. Their investment returns went up, their administrative costs went down, and significant money was saved. And we could do this here. And it wouldn't touch anyone's benefit. It wouldn't result in a constitutional battle. It would be fair, it would be reasonable. It would just save money to the system. But it's not been something we've focused on because there's been so much focus in the fight and the the contentious back and forth and the efforts to demonize people. We've got to move away from that. We've got to stop that. We've got to honor the contract. And we've got to find sensible, reasonable constitutional ways to identify specific aspects like this of the pension system that honestly never should have been created and find a way to change those in a reasonable way. And if we do all that, we can get this done. It's not going to be quick. It's not going to be painless. It's going to be expensive. But we have the resources to do it if we don't continue to further dig a hole and make the situation even worse. Mm -hmm. We need to go, Daniel, last okay. question. All right, so last question. There's four hands up. So I'm going to let all of you ask your questions quickly, and I'm going to do a lightning round of quick answers. <laughs> so starting with you, and then okay. back there. Other people may know the answer to this. I don't. In viewing the other Democratic gubernatorial candidates, especially, say, Pritzker and mm -hmm. Kennedy, what is their position in regard to fair taxes, especially the fair in income tax issues? Great. So the first question is, what do the other candidates think about fair, the fair income tax? Next. Oh, my question is about income tax. Would you consider an increase in how retirement income is taxed? Great. I think there are two more on that. Yep. Go ahead. Do you have a copy of that elevator speech on paper? <laughs> <laughs> um, you should, sir. All right. And you? Just a comment. Um, in regard to the pensions, I think it's really important that people understand it. Teachers pay 9% into the pension system right. and always have had to do that, but it hasn't been an option. Mm -hmm. So this is our retirement, and we do not get Social Security, nor do we pay into Social Security. So if you are skeptical about the system or you think it's really padding on our future income as retirees, please think again. Same and, police and fire. Yeah, and you know, now there's been a bill that just passed, this is part of the budget deal, where our colleagues, starting in 2011, have the choice to either um, basically pay in more, then they're going to expect to receive this higher retirees or go towards public tier three, which is a 401k system. And that's up for grabs because it's all been shifted to the local district. So, yeah, and, and to make matters worse, they've already been paying in more than they were going to receive right. since 2011. Well, since that, that system is probably illegally stingy, is the truth. Yeah. And I think Notre Dame had a question as well. Is that right? <laughs> or no? No? Okay. Um, all right, so um, 
the answer to your question is very simple. We have uh, we have a simple one sheet of paper to help talk about the campaign that includes the elevator speech and, all, speech and also answers to simple questions. We'd be excited to share that with uh, anyone. Um, and then the last question is about, uh, you know, the taxing retirement income and where the other candidates stand and so forth. And let me say this. So first of all, on taxing retirement income, there's no retirement income in Illinois that's taxed, whether it's a public pension, a private pension, a 401k, an IRA, anything else. And Illinois is one of very few states that do that, and that leads some people to say, why don't we just act like other states and tax pensions, and here's why. Illinois, broken record alert, is also one of very few states that has a flat tax provision in the Constitution, which means that it's not possible to tax retirement income at a lower rate. It's not possible to tax only retirement income over a certain amount. It's a question of is it in or is it out? And, you know, I meet people who are comfortable and are doing well and are in retirement and feel very happy and willing to pay an income tax on their retirement. I also meet people who are relying on a $12,000 a year social security benefit and have nothing else to their name and it seems immoral to ask someone in that situation to pay a tax. And so I'd be open to thinking about ways to have a fair retirement income tax if we were able to change the constitution first. Until that, I don't think it's the right thing to do. And so finally to Jerry's question, here's the thing. And this is a sort of, and this is to your question on a certain level too. Every candidate in this race says, therefore, a progressive income tax. Every candidate who's run for governor as a Democrat for decades has said, therefore, a progressive income tax. It hasn't happened. It hasn't happened. And why hasn't it happened? In my opinion, there are two reasons. One reason, it's about priorities. And I know, I get it, I hear you. It's drab and wretched and boring for me to stand here on a hot, hot, hot summer afternoon and talk about tax policy all day. I'm sorry. I don't mean to. I just want to fix Illinois. And if we don't focus on this first, if we don't focus on this first, we're not going to be able to fix the underlying problems that have broken our state. And I don't just say that now. I said that when I started knocking on doors in 2007 to run for governor. Oh, good lord. To run for state representative. <laughs> to run for state representative when really this issue wasn't being talked about that much by other people. I said that when I was the senator representing the wealthiest district in the state of Illinois, a district that from parochial point of view maybe wouldn't want fairer taxation, but I felt like I wasn't going to just candor, I was going to do what I thought the state needed. It's something I've understood since my first minute in public life that we had to do, and I'm prepared to prioritize it above all other things, because if we want to be able to look back in a decade from a very different kind of Illinois than the one we currently live in, we're going to need to do this. We're just going to have to do this. And so the other thing I would say is it's not just about prioritization, it's about building a coalition to get it done. Because the other reason that this is difficult is because of who pays for the campaigns. I will tell you that even though I've been so vocal about this for so long, about a year and a half ago, the head of the Chamber of Commerce came to my office in the Capitol and said, hey, I know that you, for political reasons, have to say you're for the progressive income tax. Could you just kind of cool your jets about it? Just like, don't fight as hard as you're fighting, could you? I'm just like, dude, no, I'm going to fight harder. I'm going to fight harder, but that's the way they operate. They, they are able to push and threaten and intimate, and there's a class of big donors who fund these campaigns who have a very strong interest in having nothing change, and they're willing to wink and nod at various candidates and say, I know you've got to say this to get elected. I know you're not going to, I'm not asking you to change your position after the election, I'm just asking you not to push that hard after the election, and it can die a quiet death, and everyone's going to be happy, right, wink, wink? And if we want that not to happen, we have to not only elect someone who's willing to prioritize it, we have to change the way we fund campaigns in Illinois. And I want to end, thank you. I want to end not talking just about the laws that we have to pass, but about how this campaign has worked. Because one way that I was sort of thinking your question might have gone about how are you going to win around Illinois, which is a question I get very frequently, though it's usually asked in a more polite way than I'm going to paraphrase it for you, is, so Daniel, 
you're running against many billionaires. You're running against a surprising number of nephews of presidents. <laughs> you are not a billionaire. You are not a millionaire. You are not the nephew of a president. Though my uncle could still run. He's a lovely guy. How are you going to do it? How are you going to withstand all of that? And I think that the way in which we run and the kind of coalition that we build and the way in which we get into office has a lot to do with how we are able to govern. And so I want to end by telling you a story that I think is an important story about what this campaign has been about. <coughs> you all probably remember that in December, Browner gave his campaign a $50 million contribution. $50 million out of his pocket. <coughs> and then in March, uh, Kennedy gave his campaign a $250,000 contribution. And then in April, uh, Pritzker gave his campaign a $7 million contribution. And that was something I found out about late on a Friday afternoon when it got written about in the paper. And I went home and had sort of a depressing weekend. And Karen, my wife, and I talked about this for a long time. And the basic question we ask ourselves is, is there any hope? Is this something that we can do? Should we just give up? And we thought about it, and we talked about it, and we realized, you know, we got to make a decision as a Democratic Party who we're going to be and how we're going to operate. Are we going to have an election or are we going to have an auction? Now, what does that decision mean about the future of the party and the future of the state? And what does it mean about the future of our community and the opportunities that are going to exist for our own two children? And we just decided it was too important, and we're in. We're in. And so on Monday, I did the same thing, and I wrote my campaign a $25 check. <laughs> but that's not all. I took a picture of the check, and I put the picture on Facebook, and instantly, instantly, $25 contributions are coming in from across the state of Illinois, from people I've never met before, from people who've never heard of me before, people who surely didn't know my positions on two-thirds of the issues, but people who just felt in their bones what I think most of us feel in our bones, which is the system has not been working for the rest of us. The Illinois government has been working for a few people because of who pays for the campaigns, because of how the campaigns are run, and because of therefore who the elected officials have to listen to. And I think people across the state of Illinois are hungry for a campaign that we all have a stake in, because that's going to give us a government that we all have a stake in. And a government that we all have a stake in is a government that has the political power to enact the fundamental reforms that we've been talking about all afternoon. Reforms that many of the candidates all agree on, but that I think we're only going to be able to get through the legislature if we build a new model of politics in Illinois. A model that's rooted in the kind of activism that Action for Better Tomorrow has been all about. A model that's rooted in the kind of activism that exists now around the state in a way that it did not used to. And a model that relies on engaging people across the state to invest in a campaign that all of us own to get a government that will, will work for the rest of us. And that is something worth fighting for. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm, like, late, so I'm sorry, but please be in touch. I'm happy to talk more later on. <laughs> 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 Don't forget to vote for me.